Hi, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. And today we'll be talking once again remotely with Dr. Brett Fink. Dr. Fink is an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in foot and ankle surgery and practices at the Community Health Network in Indianapolis, Indiana. Dr. Fink did his medical school training at Washington University in St. Louis. And from there, an orthopedic residency at the Portsmouth Naval Hospital in Portsmouth, Virginia. And from there, he completed two foot and ankle orthopedic fellowships, one at Boston University and the other at Miami University. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Fink. Thank you, Randall. It's always a pleasure. Today, I thought we would talk a bit about stress fractures in the foot. And I think that, that this is a fairly common problem uh, amongst active individuals and, and other types of individuals as well who might uh, have other types of conditions. But let's start out by just describing what exactly a stress fracture is and how that differs from a regular run-of-the-mill fracture that you and I might take care of. Sure. Well, a regular fracture is basically a broken bone. Really, a break and a fracture are essentially the same thing. Um, but a regular fracture comes from one large stress, uh, an accident, a twisting, uh, turning your foot, something like that. A stress fracture uh, comes on because of lots of little stresses. Um, it's kind of like uh, taking a wire. Uh, it, the, the example is always a coat hanger. If you bend it once, it may not break, but if you bend it over and over again, a lot of times it'll break. Uh, a stress fracture is just like that. It's a lot of little stresses that just overwhelm your body's ability to heal itself. And when we're talking about stress fractures in the foot, are those occurring at a specific place in the foot? Are there certain bones that are more likely to develop stress fractures than others in the foot? Well, I don't think that there is a bone in the foot that hasn't, uh, hasn't been shown to have a stress fracture at some point. But the most common ones are in the end of the forefoot, just before the ball of the foot, in the bones called the metatarsals, which are the longest bones in the front of the foot. Um, other bones that can be that are commonly uh, involved in stress fractures are the end of the fibula bone, which is along the outside of the ankle, and the navicular bone, which is just in front of the foot. Uh, if you were to look straight down at your shin, it would be more or less where the shin meets the uh, front of the foot, uh, just in front of the ankle. And, and why do people actually get stress fractures in the foot? You mentioned that this is from repetitive stress or repeated stress. So are we talking about people that have increased their activity? Are we talking about runners? Are we talking about folks who may have other di diseases of the, of the skeletal system and the bones? What leads to a stress fracture? Well, it, it's kind of a mixed bag. I, I would have to say the majority of my patients, um, you can't really identify uh, a definite cause, although I think that there are some causes that we can look for. Um, the, classic example is of, you know, uh, a kid that is used to um, not very much activity, uh, you know, a 17-year-old that goes off to boot camp and is all of a sudden thrown into an environment where they're doing a lot of activity um, every day uh, as you get in boot camp. Uh, and those people develop stress fractures because their bones just aren't used to that type of increased activity or starting a new exercise program. But the most common kind of stress fracture is just someone that comes in and has sudden pain and swelling in the front of their foot. And really, you talk to them and it's hard to identify exactly what might be causing it. Uh, those are the people that I think there's been some subtle change in their foot or some change in the way that they can heal their foot that has gone wrong to develop the stress fracture. So you've mentioned, you, you've mentioned the fact that people present to your office with pain and swelling. Any other symptoms that would uh, tip you off that, that what you may be dealing with is a stress fracture rather than some other condition in the foot? Well, really, when I'm examining someone, the, local, the, the, uh, the position of their pain is probably the most fundamental. Um, it's typical for people to come in and say, my, my foot's been hurting for a couple of weeks, I've been getting swelling. That can be a couple of different things. It could be inflammation in some of the joints around the front of the foot. It could be um, arthritis in the middle part of the foot. Uh, it could even be a neuroma. Um, but usually when uh, you have a stress fracture and you 
pinpoint the area of tenderness, it is directly on the metatarsal bones, exactly where a stress fracture should be. And so from a, a clinical perspective, from an examination perspective, from my perspective, when I'm looking at them, it is really a fairly easy diagnosis to make, even when the x-rays are, are normal, and sometimes they are. Well, I tend to remember from, from my practice years that we always sort of thought of a stress fracture as something that usually, as you mentioned, followed uh, a change in activity for the most part. And I think that, as, as I recall, about three weeks after a massive change. So, for example, if you, if you go to boot camp, uh, it's that three or four weeks into it, or if you start a new running program when you may not have run before, three to four weeks after starting that was, I think, is the, is the most common time for these types of stress fractures to present themselves. Is that still our thinking? Uh, that, that's very common. Um, the, the body reacts to new stresses by reinforcing itself. Uh, and that's and that was actually a um, there was a doctor in the 1800s named Julius Wolf who came up with that. Uh, basically, what he said is that the bone remodels itself and reforms itself in order to accommodate the stresses that it's uh, that it's uh, that are imposed on it. So, if you were an astronaut and you were weightless for a period of time, your bones would all weaken, and that's something that that people that spend long times in space that they have to be careful about. Um, it takes, I would say, I think that you're right, about three or four weeks for the bones to really remodel themselves. So if you're starting a new exercise program, it's a good idea to ease into it and to be very aware when, you're, uh, when you start developing pain because that may be a sign that you're overstressing your bone. Well, let's move on a little bit to diagnosis when the patients finally come in with foot pain. Uh, something that's driven them to seek some type of medical uh, care, medical diagnosis. What do you do on that first visit to try to get at what's causing their pain? Well, like I said, a physical examination most of the time tells me exactly what I need to know. Um, I usually get x-rays. Sometimes they're normal and sometimes they're not normal. It really depends on what stage the stress fracture is in. There is a stage of stress fracture where the, where the x-rays look completely normal. And sometimes this is early on, in the di early on in the whole progression before the bone has completely broken, where the bone is just inflamed. If you got a more sensitive study than an x-ray, like an MRI, um, then you might see a lot of swelling inside the bone uh, rather than a complete break. Um, so, even when the x-rays are normal, uh, there are situations where I have a high index of suspicion where I really know that someone probably has a stress fracture. And usually I just go ahead and treat them that way. And I check them a month later and see how they're doing. Uh, and typically they just get better over the next two or three months. So let me clarify that. What you're saying about the MRI scan is that if you're suspicious of a stress fracture and you make the diagnosis of a potential stress fracture and you don't see it on x-ray, you don't necessarily go ahead and do an MRI scan at that point. You'll go ahead and treat them with a presumptive diagnosis of a stress fracture. And if they get better, obviously they probably did have a stress fracture. If they did not, if they do not get better, then I'm assuming you either re-x-ray them at that point or proceed on with an MRI scan to make sure that that's the diagnosis? I, I think that there are only a couple of reasons to get an MRI scan. One is that someone isn't improving like I expect them to. So uh, initially, you know, a stress fracture, be, most stress fractures being uh, diagnoses that aren't particularly dangerous, I just treat them. That's the most inexpensive way, and I can treat them just as well without having the information that an MRI scan would give me as with it. Um, so typically, I do not get an MRI scan in order to work people up. Um, in certain cir circumstances, when the diagnosis is, is important to straighten out right away, then I'll get an MRI scan. And the most common cause is a navicular stress fracture, which is a much more serious injury. But if some uh, people clinically seem to have what looks like a stress fracture, 
then I'll just treat them without the MRI. Now, you mentioned the difference between the metatarsal stress fracture and the navicular stress fracture. Do the symptoms differ, or are they confusing from the standpoint that they appear to be the same, or can you distinguish which of those stress fractures you might be dealing with? Well, it's more or less the location. The, uh, the metatarsal stress fractures will be near the metatarsals in the front of the foot, and the navicular stress fractures will be near the navicular, which is right in front of the ankle. Uh, it's also a different type of patient. A navicular stress fracture is more commonly a runner, really. A, a metatarsal stress fracture I tend to see in middle-aged, most commonly women. Um, and navicular stress fracture, uh, most commonly, again, it's in women, but it tends to be in younger patients and in athletes. And so they're, they're kind of a different population set. But the most important thing is really knowing exactly where, you're, where it's tender and that tells me whether I, wh which fracture I should be suspicious of. Now you mentioned you might be a little bit more aggressive if it's a navicular stress fracture. In that case, would you go ahead and do something like an MRI scan or perhaps a CAT scan if you're suspicious that you're dealing with an evolving stress fracture in the navicular? Yes, I will. Uh, if, uh, I think, and I think that either study is reasonable. Um, an MRI is uh, slightly more sensitive, meaning it'll, it'll show um, a fracture that is, is, is really at the swelling stage only, whereas a CAT scan really has to have some change in the bone. Uh, an MRI scan, of course, is a scan that uh, images the foot with radio waves, which shows um, things like the condition of the soft tissues, whether the tissue is swollen or not. A CAT scan shows only the bones, just like an x-ray, but can show the bones in much more detail. And a CAT scan, I think, is, is, or an MRI is more important when you're really looking for a diagnosis. A CAT scan is important when you're looking to assess uh, healing. So if, uh, if I have a navicular stress fracture and I'm worried that it hasn't healed, then a CAT scan would probably be the, uh, would be the test that I'd uh, go for. If, uh, if I've got an, a person that I suspect has a stress fracture of their navicular bone then, uh, and the x-rays are normal, then I might get an MRI just because I, I know it'll pick up a couple more stress fractures that I should know about uh, than a CAT scan would. Any other special lab tests or anything that you feel are required in certain situations? Yeah, I, I do think that there are some lab tests that that now I am getting almost routinely with, with people with uh, stress fractures. Uh, and that is uh, looking at um, reasons that they might not be healing well. And uh, the tests that I get are a test to look at um, a hormone that the body uses to repair itself called the parathyroid hormone. And I also get a, a serum vitamin D level, which looks at whether someone is vitamin D deficient. Uh, vitamin D is a, a, is a vitamin that the body uses to help uh, regulate bone healing. Uh, and what we found over the last couple of years is that a lot of people with these um, stress injuries uh, are vitamin D deficient. And I think it's important to um, make sure that we uh, give them enough vitamin D because, of course, this medicine is very cheap. Um, so that, that's almost a routine part of my workup for someone with a... Uh, uh, stress fracture now. Well, let's talk a little bit about treatment and let's maybe begin by treatment of, of the common metatarsal stress fracture and then move on to the perhaps a little more complicated stress fractures that involve the navicular bone in the foot. How would you normally start treatment with both of those fractures? Well, for the metatarsal fractures, um, initially I look at the foot and I try to get some clue as to why things this might be happening. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, midfoot arthritis. Um, I think that midfoot arthritis and stress fractures occur um, in, for very similar reasons. And I think that um, to some extent what is happening is that um, people are developing weakness in some of their muscles. Um, stress fractures can occur after plantar fascial releases, which is a surgery for plantar fasciitis. And I think that um, when the arch fails, that these stress fractures are much more common. So 
I'll look at people for that kind of thing. And in those situations, once the stress fracture is healed, I think it's important to work on strengthening those muscles because we don't want more stress fractures to occur down the road. Um, as the name implies, a stress fracture occurs because of stress. And if you have a stress fracture, then, uh, then obviously your body is not able to keep up with a stress that injures it on a very small basis every day. So you've got to take away some of that stress in order to give the body a chance to catch up. Um, so often, depending upon how bad the stress fracture is, I will put the, the patient or I will put people in either uh, a firm soled shoe such as a rocker bottom, uh, a rocker soled shoe, uh, or a cast boot, or even a cast, uh, depending on how bad it is, because I really don't want that stress fracture to uh, progress and to go from being just swollen or non-displaced to a displaced st stress fracture. Uh, one that where the bone has moved, uh, which might make the uh, foot less functional afterwards. Uh, and I continue that until they start to improve uh, in terms of their pain. Um, I also look at the x-rays, but pain is probably the most important thing uh, that indicates to me that a fracture is healing. And as the pain resolves, I increase their activity. And we kind of look at what their goals might be for activity. If it's someone that's just uh, that's just trying to get back to normal walking, then uh, then we gradually increase their activity until they're able to get back to that level. If it's someone that uh, that wants to be a runner, then uh, again the uh, the uh, the rehab is going to be a little bit intensified. Um, and then we look again at metabolic reasons. Uh, I think specifically some of the important things that, to look at are um, whether they're ovulating. Um, a lot of women that, um, that stop ovulating because they have gotten too thin uh, will develop stress fractures. And if that's the case, then you might put them on birth control pills in order to, uh, in order to get their cycle more regular. Um, and if the laboratory tests come, by, come back that they're vitamin D deficient, then I'll give them vitamin D tablets, a, a much higher strength than you normally get in the, uh, in the drugstore. Um, and then if they've got some abnormality of their uh, parathyroid ho hormone, then I'll have an endocrinologist evaluate them to, to, see, to see whether there might be some problem with it. And common problems that you might have with uh, the parathyroid hormone would be a little tumor that causes the parathyroid to start producing more parathyroid ho hormone. And what about the navicular fracture? Do you treat that any differently uh, when you begin treating it or pretty much the same way? Navicular, navicular fractures are a little bit tougher. And if uh, a, the navicular bone is really the center of the arch, uh, it is under a great deal of stress. And if it deforms itself, then you could end up with, uh, with uh, really a non-functional uh, non-functional joints in the middle of the, your foot. Uh, it can basically ruin the, uh, the subtalar joint, which is the joint that allows you to uh, bring your foot into the midline and outward, kind of rotate it around, move it from side to side, um, and the joints in the arch. Uh, so if that happens, it really is a disaster. So for someone with um, just swelling in the navicular bone, I will usually keep them non-weight bearing until the pain goes away. If the person is an athlete um, and potentially if the bone has completely fractured, those are some that we usually will go ahead and fix. Uh, and the operation to fix them is very simple. Uh, it's percutaneous, meaning that it uses very small incisions that go through the skin. And basically what you do is you put a screw from one side to the other that stabilizes the bone and gets it to heal much faster and much more reliably. Um, and I think, you know, I am not, as you know, one to push surgery when you don't need it. But in that situation, I think that surgery really does a great deal to keep you from having complications and to increase the chance that this heals up uh, quickly and with minimal fuss.
And do you uh, go back in and remove that screw, or is that screw there for forever? I usually leave it in unless the unless the person is having symptoms. So uh, I will probably remove uh, five percent of them. Uh, my feeling is that once that navicular bone has shown that it has the potential to fracture, that removing it is just asking for trouble. So unless people are really having some difficulty with the screw, which is very rare, I leave it in. And let's talk a little bit about, about how long it takes for these to heal. You, you mentioned that you look at pain for at least the metatarsal fracture, and I'm assuming also for the navicular fracture. How long is it before these two fractures get to a point to where people can be back to their normal everyday activity? Well, healing from a, a stress fracture or any injury is a process, so it's always a little hard to say, well, at this point you're healed. Um, typically, people with um, metatarsal stress fractures take a month or two of reduced activity before they're able to resume more or less normal activities in shoes. Uh, I would say that typically about four months before they're able to start athletic activities, and it may be six months or more before they're able, before they really feel normal. Uh, as far as navicular fractures are concerned, um, again, I'm very careful with them. The ones that I treat non-operatively, I will keep them non-weight bearing until really the fracture is essentially pain free. The ones that I operate on, I find that they heal up very fast, so within a month, they really most of them that aren't terribly displaced will be back to normal. Um, but uh, again, I, I um, typically keep them from athletic activities until I have confirmed that they've healed by getting a CAT scan. You know, we probably ought to talk a bit about the, the potential complications of a navicular fracture. It sounds like the fracture of the metatarsal, not, a, not as much of a of a chance of really causing, uh, I think, as you put it, a disaster down the road. What happens when you ignore the pain from a navicular fracture and it goes ahead to uh, become a full-blown displaced stress fracture? I mean, what is the patient looking at at a potential, uh, a potential sort of treatment options at that point and maybe the outcome uh, at that point if they let this go? Well. Again, the, the navicular bone is really a, really occupies a key part of the foot. It is uh, one side of the navicular bone is the talonavicular joint, which is the joint between the talus, the ankle bone, and the navicular. The other side is the joint between the navicular and the three cuneiform bones. So again, it is kind of the, uh, almost the, the keystone of the arch. Um, and once it, if it goes on to, to really develop a lot of um, comminution, breaking up, uh, it can ruin both of those joints. And so what you might end up with is a, uh, is a foot that really has um, a, an extremely arthritic talonavicular joint, an extremely arthritic calcaneo, or navicular cuneiform joint, and a crumbled up navicular bone in between. And it uh, becomes a very challenging surgical situation. Um, people like that um, usually will go on to require a fusion of their talonavicular joint, their navicular cuneiform joint, and possibly even the rest of their subtalar joint, um, which again is a very extensive operation and leaves the foot extremely stiff. The ankle still works, so you have the up and down motion but the foot loses its ability to adjust to uneven surfaces. And so it's really, um, it's really not quite a normal foot, even when things go very well. So it is something that, I, that, that I, I worry about a lot when I see people like that. Well, thanks for clarifying that. I did want to bring that out for patients who may think that this is just one of those things that they just sort of run through or keep moving. Uh, you know, no pain, no gain. This is not one of those things. This can lead to fairly extensive problems down the road, which you may never recover from. So thank you for clarifying that for patients. Exactly, and it, it is, it's especially disappointing because a, a great many of these people that develop these problems are athletes, and uh, you know they may be in their, the, the prime of their um, athletics, and it may, it may 
uh, bother them uh, a lot psych psychologically to lose that ability to do things. Uh, to tell, to take someone that is, you know, running miles and miles on a competitive basis, and to tell them that that they're really relegated to um, riding on a bicycle as the as the uh, highest form of their athletic activity is is very disappointing to people. Well, I think this has been a wonderful discussion about stress fractures of the foot and ankle. Anything that you feel that we haven't discussed up to this point that patients need to know about either these two types of fractures, these two types of stress fractures in the foot, or any other stress fracture in the foot or ankle that we haven't discussed at this point? Well, the other, uh, there is one other stress fracture that we haven't quite discussed, and that's a a stress fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal, which is kind of an unusual one. Um, these uh, can start as pain along the outside border of the foot, um, more or less where the prominence of the bone is on the outside of the foot. And uh, usually they occur in people with very, very high arches. Um, and uh, uh, that is also one that sometimes has difficulty healing up because it is uh, under a great deal of stress. And uh, occasionally, I don't think in every case, but occasionally uh, people that develop that stress fracture also require a surgery which is very similar to the navicular bone and requires a screw that goes down the center of the bone to stabilize it. Uh, but it is also an interesting stress fracture. Um, but other than that, I, I can't think of anything. There, there is a great deal that we could talk about uh, about stress fractures, but I think that covers what uh, most people that might be experiencing these stress fractures might need to know. Well, I want to thank you for joining us again today. This has been a great discussion. I think patients will find a lot of useful information if they're having pain in their foot or if they're currently diagnosed with a stress fracture. So thank you very, very much for sharing this with patients and look forward to further discussions in the future. Thank you very much. I always enjoy it. Thank you very much.